As professional technicians, we use an arsenal of diagnostic equipment to help us find the problems that our customers bring to us. There's one of those tools, though, that doesn't always get the attention that it really deserves. Well, we're going to change that today, so stick around. That's coming up on The Trainer. The tool I'm referring to is your trusty DVOM or digital volt ohmmeter. This is a tool that should be in every technician's toolbox and should be one of the first tools you grab when you're faced with an electrical concern. Today, I wanna to share a few tips on what to look for if you're in the market for a new one, and also a few testing techniques that you may or may not be familiar with that could help speed up your diagnostic process. Let's get started. Now, what are some of the things that you wanna look for when shopping for a new meter? Well, let's start off by saying this. If you're a professional, this is not a purchase decision. This is an investment decision. Now, I recently added this Fluke 88 to my personal toolbox, and I did so for a number of reasons. Number one, I'm very familiar with Fluke's reputation for making these type of tools. Uh, they have a strong history, they're dependable, they're durable, uh, they have a great support structure, and they have uh, excellent warranty support if it's needed. But they're not the only ones who do that. In fact, I want to stress here that this tool is actually replacing a UEI meter that served me very well for over a dozen years. And that meter would still be serving me today if I had taken a little better care of it. But one thing you need to consider as professional, again, this is not a, a purchase that you're going to use for a few days. This is an investment and something that should last you a long, long time. So consider that when you're making your purchase decision. Now, once you kind of have a, the brands narrowed down to what you're looking at, now we can start looking in more detail of what uh, you should have in that tool. Uh, the very first thing is, what is the tool's input impedance? Here, you're looking for 10 mega ohms or more. Uh, the reason, you want to make sure that your readings are accurate, especially the your voltage readings are accurate, and the input impedance is going to help ensure that. I guess the easiest way to consider that is it helps keep the tool invisible to the circuit that you're attached to. Along those same lines, on the AC side, you want to make sure that your meter is true RMS. That's to make sure that the AC readings that you get are accurate. Uh, the other thing I want to make sure of is that my current jacks are fused. Uh, now, the fuses aren't necessarily inexpensive, but it's a lot blower, uh, better to blow that fuse than it is to let all the smoke out of this brand new tool. So make sure those fuses are, are, are those jacks are fuse protected. Um, another thing I think you should strongly consider, even if you're not doing hybrid work in your shop, the electrification of the automobile is inevitable. It's, it's coming. Invest in the tool now so that you don't have to do it later. Make sure the tool you purchase is at least Cat3 1000 volts rated or better. Uh, this way, when you do get that HV in your, into your shop, you have the capability to, to measure that safely. And I want to stress here, uh, and, uh, it's very important that you keep in mind, and not just the meter, but the leads. The leads have to be Cat3 1000 volts or better, uh, just like the ones that came with the flute meter. Okay, these are rated. And there's even a safety feature on these. You know, there's that little, I don't know if you can see it, there's that little screw-in feature there that allows me to put some type of adapter on the end. But if I do that, the little window that shows that they're rated, that disappears. And that made me think, my meter might be okay, the leads going to the component might be okay, but if I've got some type of ad adapter, like a, a screw-on alligator clip or something, that I put on the end that is not rated, well, that becomes a weak point and a safety concern. So if you are working on HV or you're preparing to work on HV, um, Cat3 1000 volts tool, leads, and any adapters that you plan to use, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about some of the individual features that I like to look for. Um, first, my favorite, MinMax. I like the MinMax button because it allows me to record what it says, the minimum and the maximum readings during a single test that I can go back and look at. Uh, we're actually gonna use that in one of the very first tests that we perform on the vehicle. Um, auto ranging is another feature that a lot of technicians like. Uh, this allows me, I don't have to select a specific scale. Uh, the meter will pick up whatever 
uh, reading it is attached to, and then I can go from there to dial the scale down to a number that I'm comfortable with or, or an image that I'm comfortable with. It's kind of like I'm being on a scope using a really wide voltage and time base to, just to get something on the screen and then narrowing those parameters down to see exactly what you want to see. Um, the relative feature is a nice one. It's kind of like a zeroing function. And uh, there's several others that are on this meter. Uh, believe me, there, this, is, this has got more to it than I'm totally familiar with. Uh, a lot of bells and whistles on it. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting ready to learn. But those are the ones I think you're going to find that provide you uh, with 85% coverage of the tests that you're going to perform routinely with your DVOM. All right. So with that covered, let's say we go back over to the truck and actually perform a few tests. This test that I want to show you is something that I would encourage you to perform on every customer vehicle that you service. It's a very quick down and dirty battery charging system test and it only takes a couple of minutes to perform. This is a great service for your customer, especially if you live in those states in the colder climates. You guys really know and understand that on a nice warm day that vehicle may start just fine, but as soon as the mercury starts to dip, your customer could find themselves stranded, unable to start their car because the battery's just not up to the task. If you can perform a very quick test while they're already in your shop to get an idea of how healthy their battery is, and you can point out that weakness before it becomes a problem, well, you'll be the hero, right? I think you know where I'm going with that. And it's a very simple test to perform. We're just gonna set our meter on the voltage scale. And then I'm going to overcome the auto ranging feature. I wanna select uh, my screen, two decimal point reading. So we'll just scroll through that until we get that two decimal point reading. And then I'm going to connect the meter to the battery. Now, if you're gonna use adapters like I'm using here, make sure that they're good and snug so that you have a good contact and that you also have a good contact at the battery itself where it's going to affect your readings. So we're just gonna go positive to positive, negative to negative. And then we're going to take a look at the reading on our meter. Now, what are we reading here? This is called open circuit voltage or OCV. Open circuit voltage is simply the voltage potential contained in the battery at rest. There's no load. There's nothing causing any demands on the battery. It's just sitting there minding its own business. It's also a good indication of the state of charge of the battery. With six cells and each one supposedly having 2.1 piece, a fully charged battery should read a minimum of 12.6. And that's what we're showing here on the meter, a little over 12.6 volts. So I, right now the state of charge in this battery is plenty good for me to proceed with my testing. If it's below 12.4 though, well that indicates a severely discharged battery. I need to go ahead and charge the battery before I proceed, retest it, make sure it's strong enough to do the job. If I find a problem at this stage, well, of course, I'm going to recommend a replacement for my customer, and then I'll go on to verify and finish checking the charging system. Now, the next step, once I've got the good state of charge here, I know I'm okay to proceed, is now I need to load the battery down and then let it run so I can capture loaded voltage and charging system voltage. And I'm going to use the starting system and the engine as the load. But before I do that, uh, do anything with that, I need to select the min-max function on the meter. Now I'm going to go around. I'm going to go ahead and start uh, the engine and shut it off. Start the engine, shut it off. Start the engine, shut it off. I like to go three times to, good, to put a good load on the battery. All right. So let me go ahead and do that, and we'll be right back. <clears throat> now we have our test results. Now it's time to take a look at what our min-max readings are and analyze them to get an idea of what kind of shape the battery and charging system really are in. Uh, hit the button, get to max reading. I've got 14.55 volts. Well, that's charging system voltage, isn't it? 13.5 to 14.5 is considered an acceptable range. So I'm feeling pretty good about the condition of the charging system. What if you got a reading, though, of 16, even 17 volts? Would you be condemning parts? Not so fast. There are some models that use a specific charging system strategy that does allow for a higher initial charging voltage, but only for the first few minutes of, of engine operation. And then it tapers back down to a more normal range. And since we're using a min-max feature, that's what we're gonna capture. We're gonna capture that max number. So if you see that, 
don't go start replacing parts or calling for the service rider quite yet. Go to your service information system, review the charging system strategy and specifications for the vehicle you're servicing to make sure that that's not a normal condition. All right, now that we've got the high side taken care of, we'll hit the button one more time and go to minimum. That's 9.5 something, 9.5 change. All I know is 9.5 is a bad number. That's right borderline of what I wanna see on a loaded voltage specification. If we do a further visual inspection, we can see that there's a lot of evidence that the battery in this vehicle is actually the original equipment battery. And this is a 2013 model. I think I'd be pretty safe to say going to the customer that, hey, you didn't have a problem getting here today, but there are indications that your battery is on its last legs. We really don't wanna see you stranded somewhere, especially if I'm living in a cold state, uh, waiting to try to get your car started, or waiting for that tow truck to show up. Why don't you go ahead and let us replace that battery today? All right, so that takes care of the quick down and dirty battery test. Let's move on to another one. Okay, the next testing method that I'd like to share with you is one that you can use to hunt down those haunting parasitic drains. What is a parasitic drain? That is anything that's demanding of the battery when everything is supposed to be shut off, when the vehicle's just sitting there, key's not even in it. And what this causes is the battery to slowly discharge to the point where it can no longer start the vehicle, and that's where your customer's complaint is coming in, isn't it? Increasingly common causes of parasitic drain are electronic control modules that are, just aren't shutting off when they're supposed to. They're not going to sleep like they're supposed to. How do you find those? Well, the old techniques of opening up a uh, connection in the circuit or plugging, unplugging a device to see if that's what's causing the drain can actually mask the cause. So an old method has gained new, uh, new birth, if you will, and has been increasingly popular. It uses the theory of voltage drop in order to find the causes of the drain. Now, let's see if I can give this in a quick synopsis. We do have videos on our MotorAge YouTube channel that go into this process in a lot more detail. If you'd like to learn more, of course, I encourage you to go there and look those up. But the synopsis is this. Everything in the circuit has resistance, everything. And when current is trying to be pushed through, electrons are trying to be pushed through the resistance, there's going to be a drop of voltage that electromotive force, if you will, across that resistance. Now we know that the load, the component that's doing the work in the circuit is the primary source of that resistance, but everything in the circuit has some, including the fuses. So if there's current flowing, I should be able to go to the fuse box and start measuring the drop across the fuses to see if there's any evidence of current flow. In other words, if I get a perfect zero reading, no current is flowing, there's no voltage drop, there's no current flowing. If I do get a reading, then that indicates that current's flowing when it's not supposed to. Now here's where having a, a good meter really comes into play because we're gonna be using the millivolt scale of the meter and we're gonna be reading very small voltages. Let me go ahead and demonstrate that for you. Okay, so here I'm gonna try to give you a close up of the fuse box that we have access to and then of course the meter. Now the very first thing I want you to notice on the meter is how that meter is on the millivolt scale and the gauge is just bouncing around. It's not settling down in any particular number. And my meter leads, they're not even, uh, they're not even touching, they're not attached to anything. Uh, a lot of people refer to this as ghost voltage, but if my meters touch together, that ghost voltage, it should go away, should zero out perfectly, as you can see here. What this can provide is an indication that, hey, we're not really on a good contact, we're really not making good contact with our fuse because our meeting's bouncing around. So that's, that, we want to keep that in mind when we do this test. Now we're, we're going to the top of these fuses, uh, these, these space style fuses, and if you look at one, there's, there's just a narrow, very narrow window, very narrow opening there for you to be able to touch the fuse. Um, so we're just gonna go ahead and, and measure across the fuses and see what happens on our meter. So we'll get this first one. Okay, that settled down pretty quickly, perfect zero. I'm not measuring any voltage drop, therefore there's no current flow. We'll move on to the next one. Same thing, settle down very quickly, measuring a perfect zero, no current flow. Move on to the next one. Up, 
1.4 millivolts. Now note two things. We have a reading, so we're measuring a voltage drop across this fuse. That means there's current flowing through the circuit. That could be the cause of the drain. And we know we're making good contact because the reading is nice and stable. It's not bouncing around. Now, in my mind, if I'm looking for the cause of a known drain and I see that 1.4 millivolts, I know I've identified the fuse that current is passing through. And the next step is to pull up the power distribution diagram out of my service information system to see what circuits that fuse is protecting. And from there, I can isolate them further to locate the exact cause of the drain. Am I concerned about just how much current flow the 1.4 millivolts represents? Personally, not really. But if you want to, you can go online and download charts that will tell you for a specific fuse and voltage drop in millivolts what that equates to in current flow. There, it's all going to vary based on the rating of the fuse and the design of the fuse. So all those resistances are, are a little bit different. In this case, this is a 10 amp mini fuse. And if I look that up on the chart, I'll find that equates to 189 milliamps of current flow. Now, that's all based on Ohm's law. It's not hard to do the math if you know all the values, but hey, someone else has already done the work. Just Google it. <laughs> 189 milliamps, is that too much? Well, the standard that we all tend to go by is 30 to 50 milliamps. But again, go to your service information system and make sure some vehicles the modules on the vehicle may not time out or go to sleep for quite some time. We have to make sure that they are indeed all asleep when they're supposed to be. For example, if we have a module that's not going to go to sleep for six hours and I'm checking it in the first 30 minutes, that could lead me to a wild goose chase. But if all of those conditions are met and I'm over the specifications, I now have a starting point. Now we've just kind of touched on the surface of how valuable a piece of diagnostic equipment your DVOM can be. There's a lot more ways that you can put that tool to work and I invite you to go to MotorAge.com and the MotorAge YouTube channel to learn more. But that's going to do it for the time that we have today. I'll see you next month on The Trainer.